Thanks very much, Bridget. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to talk to you about ecosystem service scenarios. Uh, these are the questions I'd like to cover. I'd like to just um, explore with you what scenarios are for and particularly draw on the experience that we've had in the National Ecosystem Assessment that Steve so eloquently described to us. Um, I'd like to reflect a little on what we achieved in that work, but I'm conscious that this audience is a very general one and um, I want to try to broaden the discussion towards the end and say, well, what kind of general lessons have we learned about scenarios and where does that think, where do, do we think we need to go next? So that's what I'm going to cover. I realise this image probably means nothing to half of the audience if you're from outside the UK. What's a strange box like that doing on a hillside? Well, that is a police box. They were common way back in the 20th century. Policemen sheltered in those boxes and had a cup of tea and the public could phone the police before mobile phones. But that is not a police box. It's a time machine. That's a TARDIS. It's the time machine of an infamous children's TV character, Doctor Who. And in that box, he travelled all over the universe. And um, it took him to some surprising places. Now, scenarios are time machines. And I think they too can take us to some surprising places. And we'll see perhaps one of those places at the end of the talk. So let's kick off and um, explore what scenarios are for. Well, just before we get into that, a little bit of background. Why is this experience in the UK NEA of interest to anybody outside the UK? Well, as Steve as said, the ecosystem approach has been championed as a way of delivering conservation and biodiversity and sustainable forms of, of, of development. We claim, you know, when we advocate this, when we teach our students, that it can bring a richer body of knowledge um, into the decision-making arena. But, and what's the but? Well, I would put it to you, evidence to substantiate that claim is often lacking. Now, I know that's a dangerous assertion to make, and probably every one of you in this hall can stand up and say, ah, but I can show. Okay? The trouble is, it often is no more than a gut feeling. It's based on individual experience. We're very bad about writing that up and writing convincing cases that's going to convince a banker or an insurance broker or a trader in the London Stock Exchange to take the ecosystem approach seriously. We've got a long way to go, really, to show where and how that approach can stimulate the uptake of useful, and use, and, 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 you know, useful knowledge about ecosystems and use it in effective ways. So I think, you know, facing that challenge, some of the experience that we've gained in the UK and EA can actually help us reflect on those issues. And I'm not going to try to cover all of the NEA, it's, it's vast. Um, I simply want to focus on the bit that we've been preoccupied with, which is scenarios. And the particular tension I want to explore with you in, in the context of those scenarios is this one between things that we might describe as processes and things that we might... It's the TARDIS arriving. <laughs> That's the kind of noise the TARDIS made when Doctor Who was about to appear. Um, process and product, that's the dimension I want to explore with you. Okay, so what are scenarios for? Well, they're for many purposes. If you sat in this morning, you saw people talking about scenarios of, of nitrogen and ozone futures. We can use scenarios clearly for different purposes. At the risk of being rather extreme here in, in terms of caricaturing what we can use them for, let's think of two ends of a spectrum. We can use them to have a conversation, a deliberative conversation, and there's a picture there of some discussions about the NEA scenarios in Northern Ireland, a process of deliberation, 
On the other hand, we can think of them as machines that generate kind of predictions or projections. A set of maps, and Steve's already shown you these maps of the scenarios in, in UK NEA. Let's just explore that a little bit further. One of the things that clearly worried us at the end of the five kilogram stage of the NEA was, well, these scenarios that we've come up with, are they any good? Not many people ask these kind of questions of their scenarios. Usually you move on to other things. But we were preoccupied with trying to write this up and said, okay, well, we've got some scenarios now. Are they an actually, actually, did they actually deliver anything? There is a debate out there in the literature, some very useful papers that Mike Hume and others have um, authored. And these are the three kind of criteria you could use to apply to scenarios, given this question, are they any good? Are they any good in terms of their predictive power? Scenarios are clearly about the future. Are we right in those projections? On the other hand, these scenarios are not just academic exercises. We're trying to use them in a decision support role. Well, do they lead to better decision making? Are they effective decision support tools? Or finally, do they actually help us understand what's going on around us in the world? You know, are they tools that would promote social learning? You know, that, that might underpin better decision making and so on. Okay. So there are these different dimensions and criteria we could apply to any set of scenarios. And so we thought we'd look at those in relation to the NEA scenarios. Now, fortunately, we didn't act very swiftly. And the second chunk of work with the NEA came along, the follow-on phase. And it's in that follow-on phase where we've been able to explore these questions in a little bit more detail. So what I want to um, do here is just look at some of the achievements of um, the work that we've, we've done in this, this second phase. And I want to kick off by looking at this process dimension. Okay, what justifies looking at it from a process dimension? Well, go back to the principles of the ecosystem approach. It's all about social choices. It's about identifying the values that people attach to ecosystem services. Okay. It's about finding governance relationships at appropriate scales and so on. None of these things you can take out of a scientific textbook. They're things that have to be constructed by communities, by groups coming together. So essentially, the ecosystem approach is a deliberative process. And we've certainly discovered that in, um, in our work. We took our scenarios, which were created through uh, a process of discussion and consultation, and used the opportunity of the follow-on phase to go back to that same kind of community, and indeed some of the same people, and say, okay, what can you make of these scenarios? Do they help us to actually answer any of the questions that perplex us today? And so we've explored with groups like this one in the wonderful setting in Northern Ireland, um, how we might use those storylines to contrast different assumptions, contrast the consequences of those assumptions, and think through what that means for today's policy responses and today's um, policy goals. We've explored some new deliberative tools. One of the other work packages in the follow-on phase is looking at the response options, the policy response options. And with them, we've, we've, we've designed or try to create something called a stress testing um, tool. It used to be called wind tunneling. The idea was that you could take today's policy responses and wind tunnel them using these alternative plausible futures. Would a policy, for example, of biodiversity offsetting stand up in a world markets environment? Okay, that kind of thing. These kind of deliberative tools are necessary to stimulate the discussion. You know, when we've had various ideas that we've tried to get groups to engage with 
you know, the problem of the future, as it were. I think there's also opportunity to develop these tools around some of the other work that's being done in, in, in the follow-on phase. One of the work packages is looking at a natural capital asset check tool. Sounds terribly complicated, doesn't it? If we've got natural capital, we've got assets there, can we check for its integrity? How would we do that? Okay, we'd start to look at the risks and threats, and clearly you've got to set that in the context of future thinking. So again, scenarios might come into that. So we've tried with these groups to think about the way you would use existing scenarios to promote discussion, to promote learning. Okay. We didn't want these scenarios that the NEA created just to sit on a shelf somewhere and never be used. Okay. We wanted them to be used and criticised actively. And we could have a discussion possibly later about how complete scenarios have to be in order not to close down that discussion. We found, in fact, they, don't, they shouldn't be over-engineered because if they're over-engineered and look too sophisticated, people are scared of them and won't wade in and say, well, I don't think it would be like that. So we've spent a good deal of time in this follow-on phase looking at the use of these scenarios as deliberative tools. We've also spent some time looking at them initially as products. Okay, and we've explored this product idea a little more um, in order to, to, to look at what new ideas that would stimulate analytical thinking and outputs might involve. And I just want to dwell on that a little bit more. Okay, these are the NEA scenarios. There are six of them. I just want to make a couple of points about them. They are essentially qualitative scenarios. Okay, we didn't use a model to generate them. We used discussion and deliberation. A major component of that discussion were the questions that people wanted to ask about the future. So, for example, we have green and pleasant land, which is a storyline that emphasises biodiversity goals as the most significant driving factor. And we contrasted that with nature at work, the one at midnight and um, at, at two o'clock there. Okay. Nature at work is a world where ecosystem services rather than biodiversity get the priority. How did we come up with that? Well, that was a question that the groups that we, we, we consulted at the outset were interested in. And at the time, they were also interested in, well, what would it mean if we went for a more local approach, local stewardship down there at 7 o'clock? Security was an issue on the agenda at that time, and still is. So a storyline was developed around that. World markets, of course, is the conventional wisdom, and go with the flow is the kind of baseline. There was a lot of discussion about the term baseline scenario, go with the flow. I would like to have called it muddling through, but go with the flow is the one we've got. We deliberately stepped out outside this kind of two-axis model for scenario building. We wanted to make sure our scenarios addressed questions that people were interested in, because then they would be used. And that's, in fact you know, led to this analysis that Steve's done. And it's great because it saves time. I don't have to describe this. But I can make a couple of new points about it. I think what was interesting about these scenarios, even though they were qualitative, we were able to do some quantitative modelling within that framework. So the scenarios that we designed, the scenario team came up with spatially explicit land cover change maps at a resolution of one kilometre or two kilometres, the economists uh, diluted it to. So these land cover change maps were the basis of the work that Ian um, subsequently published with the scenario team. And I think this you know, is a really interesting uh, product arising from that qualitative set of scenarios. And here, basically, it's a different set of maps than the one Steve showed. Um, you can see the scenarios as colours here. Each pixel on that colour is coloured in with a scenario that gives you the best value. And on the left, you've got the best value if you only consider market-based valuation. In the middle, you've got the values of these non-market goods. And on the right-hand side, you've got biodiversity. And you can see this spectrum. You move from 
world markets on the left if you only include market-based value, to nature at work if you include the purple ones. A great product, okay? You can tell it was a great product because that kind of analysis got all the press coverage at the end of the first phase of the NEA, and the other 4.9 kilos got absolutely none. People are more interested in money than in biodiversity, I'm afraid. So this is the sort of results, really. It argued that the conventional focus on market-based goods um, was possibly too narrow. And that's exactly what scenarios should do. They should challenge the conventional wisdom. They should try to get us out of the kind of narrow boxes that we're in. And targeted products like that within these qualitative scenarios can get people talking, okay? can get people acting. And we've tried to develop that kind of approach in this follow-on phase. And this is where I think our thinking about products has changed in this work. We went into this thinking, well, scenario products are basically, you take a model, you turn the handles of the model, and you produce a scenario. That is the kind of product dimension that the literature, you know, that the human others have been talking about. This idea that scenarios are basically an engineered thing. You give it to the users and say, make of that what you will. Okay. But what we've discovered is, is often those complicated scenarios simply don't get discussed. You can't challenge the assumptions of a, of a model that's been developed 150 miles away in, a, you know, in, in some kind of calculus. It's not the kind of thing that deliberation is made of. So what we've tried to suggest is that these products should be at least tailored around qualitative scenarios that people understand, that people buy into, because they have questions that interest them. And so we've pursued that idea in the follow-on phase. We've identified four thematic areas. We can't cover all of the services that are missing. We've looked at catchment modelling. We've looked at farmland birds again. We've tried to develop a few more ideas on marine and coastal. And we've gone back to this cultural and ecosystem services. We've tried to do some thematic modelling within the scenarios. And so the contrast I'd like you just to keep in your head is this idea of, rather than model-based scenarios, models that create the scenarios, think of scenarios as being the framework within which modelling takes place. Okay. And that's really, um, I think, the, the emphasis that we've, we've tried to, to bring out in this second phase. And I think this kind of work can bring out some interesting and challenging ideas. So in catchment modelling, this is work that Simon Gosling and Liz Lewis has been doing. Liz Lewis at, at um, Newcastle, very bright PhD student. They've been looking at the trade-offs between flooding and drought in 35 or so catchments across the UK under the different scenarios. And they found that there's some really interesting trade-offs, but the results are very catchment-specific. You need to take a spatially explicit approach if you're really going to start to unpack those management issues. The farmland birds... Ken Norris and others have looked at this issue about whether nature at work, for example, also delivers on biodiversity. They've done some better modelling on farmland birds and found it doesn't necessarily do that. So again, challenging those maps of Ian. Uh, in the marine and coastal, okay, we found, for example, that world markets really is quite an outlier in terms of sustainable fish um, uh, cultures um, in, in those kind of scenarios. And then in the cultural services, we found some really interesting trade-offs and synergies between biodiversity benefits and where you would target particularly woodland planting if you were going to maximise cultural ecosystem services. So we've tried to exploit and explore this product dimension in this follow-up work. But these products are nested within these qualitative scenarios because we think the user groups, having designed those scenarios to begin with, will find these products stimulating and challenging, okay? Um, we want them to be used. So what are the lessons? We think that scenario thinking can stimulate the uptake of ecosystem knowledge through things like institutional change and changing agendas. And we've tried to inter in interact with groups that are actively using these scenarios in their work. 
the groups are few in number, but it actually is encouraging that people at different scales actually are thinking about the NEA scenarios. We've certainly seen how the discussions around these scenarios can help embed ecosystem concepts in current practice and start to break down boundaries. So, for example, one of the projects we've looked at is using these NEA scenarios in the context of noise policy. Okay. And I think if we're going to um, stimulate the uptake of ecosystem knowledge, we also need to be able to show that these arguments, types of argument, can win. Okay. That we can make better arguments for ecosystems by going through these kind of processes. But that's still a long way off. We've got to try much harder to operationalize this kind of thinking um, without diluting the science concepts. And what we've got to try to do, I think, is recognize and bring together the knowledge brokerage role of people like this in the room. It was very hard to get policy customers into this room or other rooms simply to discuss NEA scenarios. And we were very pessimistic about that. But hey, they're busy people. But they do talk to others. They talk to the kind of people in this room. We need to develop that knowledge brokerage role. The people in this room do have a day or so to work on the scenarios, and the lessons that they can learn can feed back into that policy process. I think there's also a place for citizen science in all of this. We need to find ways of encouraging not just the usual, usual suspects into the room, but also the public. So just to bring things to the end, what have we tried to do? Well, we've also tried to develop this product dimension by creating some online tools. We have some Bayesian networks. Um, this is helping us to analyze the cultural ecosystem service um, data in, 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 in the NEA. There's an online version of that. You can go to the website at the bottom there and play with this. Um, it allows you to model the likely cultural ecosystem services of different groups you know, at the local authority level there. So what I've tried to cover very quickly are these questions. You know, what are scenarios for? What did the work in the NEA achieve? What are the wider lessons? And what next in terms of where we take this kind of work? What are the take-home lessons? Well, I want to put to you the predictive power of scenarios is important, but it's also their capacity to stimulate debate that we've got to take seriously. Because deliberative processes are at the heart of the ecosystem approach. And we need to unlock that power of scenarios as a way of stimulating that knowledge uptake. And I think the big learning that we've made over this period is actually scenarios can usually tell us more about the present than the future. They allow us to critically evaluate today's assumptions and today's goals. And if we do that, then maybe we'd be in a process, a better place to, to take uh, steps into the future. And that's, in fact, where Doctor Who comes back in. You know, when he pressed the buttons in the TARDIS, the exciting thing when I was a kid was where he would end up. When the doors opened, where would he be? Okay. And I think with scenarios, what we've discovered is that flying this time machine around and opening the doors, where are we? Well, we're still in today but we know a little bit better about the assumptions we're making about today, and so maybe we can plan more effectively for the future. So I'll end there, apart from saying thanks to all the people that sponsored this work, particularly the work, people who worked on it, Jamie Trattelos and James Patterson, two postdocs who've helped create these scenarios with, with me, and the many, many other people who've contributed to the discussion. Thanks very much. Two points. You mentioned go with the flow. Yep. Only dead fish go with the flow. Okay? Yep. The second one is when you go for opinions in industry, whether it's fisheries, agriculture, or anything else, they say environmental protection, environmental management is a jolly good thing. As soon as you bring in restrictions, so nations, you name it, they turn their back and they flaunt it. 
hmm. personal experience. Sure. Okay, so this was a good talk, but is illusionary. Well, I would certainly dispute that it was illusionary, um, but I don't deny the fact that developers, etc., walk away from it. So what do we do? Well, we have to. We either put them in prison or we engage with them. Okay. How do, hang on, how do we engage with them? Well, we sit down and we construct some scenarios about the future. Now, I would not say that those, that suite of scenarios is complete. One of the biggest constituencies that was missing, actually, in our original discussion was the business community. And I think we need to... Exactly. Sure. So I don't understand your question, then. I, I hear what you're saying. I'm, I'm finding it difficult to link it up with scenarios, except that, fine, we could build a storyline that had that as an element, okay? We could take some of those ideas and work on what the consequences would be. Would, would be. That's what scenario work should involve. It's not, you can't model what you've just said, okay? We can only sit down and think through the consequences of it. And that's, I think, what I'm arguing here, is that we need to construct scenarios around ideas like that. But I'm not, not arguing that it should be enforced or implemented. And none of those scenarios were ever presented as choices about the future. They were simply presented as a range of plausible possibilities against which we could test our present ideas including ones like yours. What it, it, it is effective because it allows us to look at ideas such as the ones you've uh, expressed there critically. Okay. I think I just forgive me because I'm happy. So just keep Sure. 